All right, well, Mandy, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So how's everything been going? Really well. So I've been busy. Nice, nice, nice. Yes. Uh, excellent. So uh, last time we were here, we talked a little bit about um, one of the things that you see sort of the, the most common sort of thing you see as far as like dog owners and the mistakes they make is treating their dogs like kids. Yes. How do you approach the owners in that situation? Because obviously the, that, the onus for that to be fixed is on the owners to stop treating their dogs like kids. You know what I mean? Um, I guess, how do you approach those, those sort of situations where, you know, the owners just continue to kind of spoil the dog or, or not treat it like a dog? So for me, you know, there's nothing wrong with spoiling your dog. Mm. And I always explain to people for training purposes, you can call your dog a kid, mm. but for training purposes, I have to, it's more about education. I have to teach clients to think like a dog, mm. you know, because of the fact that they don't speak English and we don't speak dog, they're never going to understand our words, you know? So it's, it's kind of having to teach them to talk less. Mm -hmm. And when I teach, they're communicating through a collar and a leash. So that actually becomes your verbal line of communication. So mm -hmm. that's how you can actually communicate to your dog in a way that they understand versus using words that they're just like, I, I always explain to people, I'm like, it's kind of like the Peanuts c cartoon mm -hmm. where it's that teacher, want, 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 mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's kind of what dogs hear. They don't pick up on what you're, what you're actually saying. So, um, it's just educating, mm -hmm. educating the client. So my neighbor has a dog, this little, little yippy toy dog that, and it's always hilarious because every time we're in the yard, the little yippy dog barks at my wife and I or whatever, we're out there just, just constantly barking. They're like, oh, like, like no, like, like they're sitting there telling the dog to stop kind of, and the dog doesn't care at oh, all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like at all. Like there's no, like this dog does it's not. It's like make me. <laughs> right. This dog does not, does not care at all. Is 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 that dog too far gone to train? You think like like after so many years, is it just like like do you run into like does anybody come bring you a dog like say later like later in the dog's life or later on where they've just been doing this one way? You know the dog's been this way for so long, but is yeah. that dog like too far gone to? So I do have a cutoff only because um, there is no dog that I've come across that's not trainable. Mm -hmm. um, age does play a factor. You know, it's, I, I kind of describe it as if you're a kid and you, you, tr you start to teach your child, um, a second language, it's mm. a lot easier for them to pick up and learn. So they're kind of like a sponge where puppies, you know, it's a lot easier to, to train a puppy. Mm. Um, the older dogs get, the more they are kind of set in their ways. So it's, mm. it's like trying to teach your grandfather something new. Mm. So it is definitely achievable, but it does take a little bit longer. Um, I have a cutoff only because you know, by the time a dog reaches like the age of eight or nine, at that point, they kind of just get stressed. Mm -hmm. And is it worth it? You know, you might have a good three years if you're lucky with your dog. So it's kind of like, do I want to put them through that just to have a dog trained when I could have started a long time ago? So Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, so tell me about, is there like a, a particular um, kind of success story uh, that maybe kind of stands out or, 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 or any one or two that kind of sort of sort of come to mind as far as, you know, dogs that were either super unruly or, or, or may have had a bite history or something like that, that, that you were able to, uh, you know, sort of rehabilitate and just kind of give a sort of a, a new lease on life for the dog and their owners. I, I do. I have a few actually. Um, I have one dog. He was a, a doodle, a mm -hmm. golden retriever poodle mix, and he had been to five other trainers and she was told that he's not trainable. She actually spent $5,000 on a trainer. Wow. Um, he had her dog for over a month. And he kind of left her, mm. never finished, never really showed her how to implement the training at home. Um, she was told by, you know, a few other people, oh, he's just a dumb doodle. And so she was very reluctant to want to sign up for training. She'd spent all this money. And then here I'm asking her to, you know, invest in me, mm. you know, and trust that I'm going to be different. Um, she did. And she's actually a counselor. And she takes her dog to work with her now. So, you know, he went from this crazy dog at the evaluation. He was just barking his head off. I was basically talking over top of this dog mm. um, just so she could hear me. And then to see the progress, you know, and for her to see it, you know, herself was so rewarding. So um, I have a Rottweiler who was two and a half and she had, they adopted her from a rescue mm -hmm. and the dog came with food aggression. So she was a stray so she knew that in order to find food, those instincts, I got to fight for my food. 
kind of stayed with her. So mm -hmm. when they adopted her, they were they never disclosed that she had food aggression. So it's kind of a fail on their part because there's no way you could have not known you're feeding mm -hmm. this dog every day. Um, so they adopted her, and an incident happened where the wife was eating her lunch, and she set her food on the coffee table. And when she went to reach to go grab it, the dog came up and bit her right in the face. So she had to get stitches across her nose. Um, and it was kind of like I was the last resort. Mm. This dog either gets trained or she gets put down. Um, that was over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And they still have her. And she's completely on and off leash trained. And they actually had a baby and um, still have her. So Nice. So yeah. in, the, in the case of the, of the doodle, you said, right? That yeah. was, uh, I guess... How how did you kind of approach that? I mean, um, I guess without giving away all your trade secrets, how how were you able to kind of get through to this dog that w where all these other trainers weren't able? Like, what were they doing wrong, or, or or what did you implement that maybe they didn't? So I train from a psychology aspect. Hmm. You know, I use a collar and a leash, and you know, it's it's kind of having to bring owners along. So when I'm, I'm teaching them, I, that's why I do evaluations. I like to actually demonstrate how I train so they can see firsthand, but they can also see how quickly I get results. Mm -hmm. You know, I train through a collar and a leash. If you think about it, the collar goes around the neck where the mom picked him up mm -hmm. when she moved him. She picked him up by the nape of the neck, moved him from place to place. She also, when the mom disciplined, she would grab him by the nape of the neck, ground shake at times, mm -hmm. you know, and so the collar going around the neck just makes sense to dogs. Um, and I can communicate. They actually start to read the leash. I handle my leash in a very specific way. So as I'm handling the leash, the dogs actually start to read it. Mm. So um, it's just, you know, teaching them that, you know, you're communicating to a dog in a way that they actually understand versus, mm. you know, with words or even treats, you know, um, nothing against treat training. You know, it works for some dogs, but in the situation with the Rottweiler, she's food aggressive. Mm. I don't want to stick my hand yeah. by its mouth with a treat. Um you know, but I can safely do it with a collar and a leash. So do owners overdo it with treats? Um, they, they do. So mm -hmm. treats in, in our world, we think food equals love. Mm -hmm. So we tend to kind of think that we're loving our dogs the more we feed them. And it just makes them overweight. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the vet field for 19 years and saw a lot of dogs come in just obese. Mm -hmm. And what we're actually doing when a dog's that overweight is it takes two and a half years off their life. So, you know, food, you can get their attention with a treat, but you don't really have the respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I want my dog to choose. They're not really having to think with a treat. You know, it's just uh, they're fixated on that that object and they want that treat. So I'll do it. But if you don't have that treat in your hand, I don't respect you enough to want to do the command. Yeah. Um, so I, I have my dogs make a choice. I want them to choose to walk nicely in my heel. Um, and not saying that, you know, treats are bribery, but in a sense, it kind of is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about it from a dog's perspective, dogs don't have an abundance of treats in the world. Mm -hmm. If people were never involved, dogs wouldn't be running around with fanny packs on, passing out cookies to each other. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> they just don't do it. Right. Those are the, that's one of the things. So there's three things that dogs will actually kill each other over food, territory, and mating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, food can sometimes be an issue with some dogs. Mm -hmm. So. Is there ever, uh, has there ever been times kind of during the evaluation process you had that you've just had to turn down a dog? This is their, their, it's either too far gone or just too much of a risk or, or for any reason, really? Um, so mainly when I turn down a dog, it's not because of the dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because of the owner. So, mm. you know, dogs are trainable. Um, there are some dogs that, you know, if they do happen to come after me during the evaluation, I, I need to know if that dog's going to potentially want to bite me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always tell people, you know, my, my prices are kind of based off an evaluation. Um, I, I, I stress dogs a little bit when I'm handling them. And that's just so I know, can I safely come into your home and train your dog? Or does it have to be a board and train? Um, if, if it does, then, you know, the dog comes with me so I can bond with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I've had some clients that aren't teachable, Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's kind of what I'm evaluating as well. Like, am I going to be able to teach you? Because obedience is never a one and done deal. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it's something that you're going to always have to implement and, and keep up with. You know, people want a quick fix. I want my dog to be trained and that's it. I don't want to do the work, but it's, it's never a one and done. If we stop leading them, 
you know, dogs actually would take the lead again. So they mm -hmm. kind of start to revert back to, and it just goes back to, you know, my theory where, you know, they're pack animals and we kind of forget that when we get a dog, we introduce them into our world and we are essentially becoming a pack, mm -hmm. but there's no real leader. So that's where a lot of the anxieties come from. Um, dogs think it's kind of their job. Mm -hmm. I need to bark at my neighbor when yeah. they're outside because <laughs> I don't want them coming in our, on our territory and coming near my pack. Um, and that's just, you know, because they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. So, so talk a little bit too about what, I guess, just the everyday kind of dog owner or anybody out there that is kind of watching this. I think, uh, you mentioned last time, a lot of times with, 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 with dogs, they start to get in trouble when they're not mentally challenged or they're not like sort of, uh, they don't have that sort of mental stimulation. Yeah. You know, they get bored, they start chewing on something, they get, you know, they, they, they act out. What are just some, just some things, um, you know, that you tell your clients that they can just kind of do on a daily basis, on a regular kind of kind of thing to to make sure that, the, you know, the dogs aren't kind of getting bored and antsy or, or whatever, you know, uh, that they can just sort of stimulate them mentally. Um, are you meaning dogs that are in training or have yet to be trained? I guess either or. So for dogs that haven't, if if, if owners can't do like sign their dog up for training, um, some some tips to help. Um, would be to, you know, kennel, mm -hmm. you know, create your dog when you're not home. And that only just, again, from working in the vet field, you know, dogs can become destructive when they're bored or if they have anxiety because they have separation anxiety. Um, I've seen plenty of exploratory surgeries mm -hmm. from dogs that decided they're going to eat half the couch mm -hmm. and now it's stuck in their abdomen yeah. and, you know, they have to go in and remove it. Or, you know, if it's a dog that just obsessively jumps on company, Put your dog on a leash. Mm -hmm. Don't allow it to fail. So I always tell people, set your dog up for success. Mm -hmm. If your dog's fearful, don't allow people to come pet it. Mm -hmm. You know, if your dog's saying everything in its body language that I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this stranger coming up and petting me, don't force them to. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some other things are, you know, if your dog's dog reactive, don't take them to a dog park. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's just kind of being aware, you know, because you always want to have your dog on a leash because then if something were to happen, you have a safe way of addressing your dog. If your dog jumps on somebody, you have a leash you can address to kind of get them off versus having to reach in and grab the collar. If the dog is, you know, potentially almost getting in a fight with another dog, you have a leash to safely address versus reaching your hands and getting bit. Mm -hmm. So house training, you know, dogs that pee and poop in the house, it's taking your physically taking your dog out on a leash. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, when they went to the bathroom. Now I can bring them back in where versus when you let them out on their own, mm. you, you, they may have gone, they may have not. And then usually as soon as people let them in, they go. Mm. So, and uh, not using pee pads. So pee pads, what they essentially teach your dog is that it's okay to pee and poop in the house. Mm. So when you take them away, that dog still thinks it's okay. Yeah. So have you ever had to deal with, um, sort of any cases uh, the, the training a dog that, that may have come from um, let's say like an animal hoarding situation or some other kind of adverse, like some of the really kind of adverse conditions previously in its life and kind of, and I'm sure it's a, on a case by case sort of basis, but how do you approach something like that? So, you know, I did have um, a golden retriever. She was actually owned by the Amish and she was used for just breeding. So she was basically a puppy factory. Mm -hmm. um, she was kept in a barn, had never stepped foot on grass. Mm -hmm. So she had very little human interaction. So she was very reluctant to want to trust people. Mm -hmm. um, I consider those dogs shy and under socialized. So they're more inclined to want to be around other dogs versus a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and just they, they have this fear. So it's going to be harder and it's going to take a little bit longer to get that dog to trust you. Mm -hmm. um, and we think, you know, we want to kind of baby them. They had a hard life. So we're, we're applying our, our emotions, our feelings. We're kind of humanizing them in, in a sense where I don't I need to baby them mm -hmm. because they ha already had a hard life where in the training, if I actually work them harder and kind of push them through those fears, they advance a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And it's just teaching them, you can trust me. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. And they get over those fears a lot faster versus avoiding those fears, which keeps them fearful. Mm -hmm. So, Do you notice a change in behavior um, in dogs dependent on what they're being fed? Like, does that, does food have an, uh, like, does what, you know, 
maybe a brand of food or, 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 or kind of food, that, like, does that have an, a, an effect on a dog's mood? So not necessarily their mood. Mm -hmm. um, I know as far as health, you know, factors go, there's, there's three brands that any veterinarian would recommend. Um, it's just a better quality food. Mm. You know, as, as people, we tend to pick the food that has the fancy commercial that sounds appeasing to our appetite. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of those companies don't really own their own factories. Mm -hmm. They don't put the money into the research and the data um, that goes into making the food. They, they're putting it into the marketing and the advertising mm -hmm. to appease to our appetite. So we want to buy the food for our dogs when the dog, if it found a dead animal, it's going to eat the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know, so... Um, and then just, you know, educating yourself, you know, a lot of people jumped onto the whole grain free bandwagon thinking that their dog needs a grain free food. Dogs are actually omnivores. They need different things like starches and, you know, carbohydrates versus just, um, just meat mm -hmm. and the grain free diet, you know, through studies, and you can look it up on the FDA's website, um, grain free diets actually can cause what's called dietary DTM, mm -hmm. which is dilated cardiomyopathy. And it's a thickening of the heart muscle um, because they, it lacks a specific um, vitamin called taurine, mm -hmm. which dogs need for development and it affects the heart. What's your take or what's your advice on, on, on adding new pets? Um, so, you know, as far as like dogs that are in training, um, I have some dogs that are reactive to cats, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's because they have a high prey drive based on what kind of breed they are. Um, the training actually alleviates that because it's, it's teaching them that you don't get to go after stuff that you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's teaching them that, you know, if I'm the alpha, you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're introducing another dog, how I train people, because I worked in the vet field, you know, I saw so many dogs get euthanized. Um, just because of behavioral issues mm -hmm. and, you know, owners were just at their wits end. Um, but how I teach owners is you should never need me again. Mm -hmm. You should never need to hire another trainer again. I basically kind of, in a, in a sense, teach clients how to be amateur dog trainers. Mm -hmm. So if they do decide to get another dog, the day that dog comes home, you start implementing the training. So that way that dog never has a chance to think I'm the alpha. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's how you can have like a harmonious pack. In, in, a, in a way, because that's what you are. Um, when I have dogs at my house, you know, I can have them out with my dogs with no problem mm -hmm. after I've, you know, established that alpha rank, in, you know, with them by working them in the obedience that usually takes three days. Mm -hmm. And then I can have all the dogs out together and they're just like, oh, hey, if she's in charge, we got to be cool. And then they just coexist. Yeah. So, you know, there are some behavioral challenges where a dog that has dog aggression, you have to be a little more cautious, mm -hmm. you know, and that takes a little longer to kind of get that influence with them. Mm -hmm. The equipment that I use. Mm -hmm. So I use things like training collars. People call them choke chains and um, prong collars. So I use prongs. And then for off leash, I use e collars. People call them shock collars. And there's, there's a big difference, mm. you know, but people see those prong collars or they call them pinch collars. Um, and they think it looks scary. Mm -mm. I don't want to put that on my dog. Mm -mm. It looks, it looks mean. I don't want to abuse my dog. You know, people associate the word correction mm. with abuse. And I'm like, your dog would have no problem. If that neighbor's dog that barks at you, if you went over to pet it, it would have no problem nipping you right. and telling you, <laughs> I didn't say you could touch me, you know, and giving you a physical correction versus, um, you know, saying, no, no, you, yeah. treat, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so that's one thing that I run into and it's just educating people. Cause all that equipment, it doesn't come with instructions. It doesn't come with how it's actually used and it can be used incorrectly, you know? And I think that's where it has like a bad reputation because people have misused it and, you know, some people don't know there's a right and wrong way to put it on. Mm. Um, it shouldn't be used for everything. There's a whole psychology behind the actual prong collar where it mimics another dog's teeth on the back of the neck. So when you give that little correction, mm -hmm. it's like another dog grabbing it by its scruff. Mm. Um, but we just think that, you know, correction means abuse. And I tell people, you know, every healthy relationship has boundaries. And how are you going to teach your dog boundaries mm. without telling, teaching it? That's unwanted in this world. You know, because that's how they would communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. They're going to play physically. They're going to be affectionate with each other. They're going to groom each other. And that's all physical. But they're also going to correct each other. Mm -hmm. If another dog jumped into my dog's face, he'd probably bite him. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. it's just that, you know, 
having to kind of re-educate people and teaching them that, you know, a, a simple correction, you know, doesn't mean you're abusing your dog because it's nothing forceful. It's just this, it's quick. Mm -hmm. So do dog fences work? Like uh, what I mean, like the, the electric dog fences and stuff like that, like, like what's your kind of thought on those and do people rely on them too much or whatever? Like, I mean, I, I guess just, yeah. What, what are some of your initial well, thoughts? I know it's, it's, um, more inexpensive way to fence in your yard versus having to put a physical fence in. I always tell people the key word is invisible, mm -hmm. that there are some dogs that will run through it. If, if they're, if they're excited enough, that adrenaline's going, that excitement's going. So that correction isn't as effective mm -hmm. because it's not overriding the adrenaline, and the excitement. And if it sees something it wants to go after, it will run straight through that fence. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw dogs get hit by cars. Well, I had an invisible fence. Keywords invisible, mm -hmm. um, but it also doesn't keep other dogs out of your yard. Mm -hmm. So depending on the area you live in, you could potentially have a stray dog run into your yard and maul your dog. For all you know, I I I always, even though I have a privacy fence, I'm always outside with my dogs. Mm -hmm. I'm always keeping an eye on them. Um, you know, I adopted them. They didn't go to the pound and be like, "Ooh, I want a Mandy." Mm -hmm. Look at that one. Look at she. She looks so scared. Let's get her. <laughs> you know. Um, it's it's just the responsible thing to do. It's mm -hmm. just always being aware of your dog. What so what physically happens to the dog when it crosses the fence line? Does it just get a shock or is it, it, it get does. like okay. Yeah. Yep. Will it continuously get that shock once it's beyond nope. the fence line or it's just, just, it's just one and done? Once it yeah, once it gets it's it, there's like a perimeter. Once it gets so close to that on either side, mm -hmm. it would get that correction. And then but they if they have enough adrenaline going, yeah. they blow right through it and they're not going to come back through then because they're like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> is there any, uh, is there any kind of sort of equipment or, 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 or anything that, that you just, or leash or, or anything like that, that you just absolutely won't use or, or against that, that, that that's kind of out there that people use? Retractable leashes. Mm -hmm. So retractable leashes are, you know, they're letting their dog have all this extra freedom um, you, they're not really sturdy. They can break. Um, my mom actually used a retractable leash on her 120 pound German shepherd oh, geez. and yeah. he saw a rabbit. And when he went to run, she went to grab it while it wrapped around her fingers and snapped him sideways. Mm. Um, you know, some of them break and then you can't stop them from continuously going. And if that dog's choosing to go up into another dog's face, mm. you know, it could start a fight that it's not ready for. Um, you know, having a more sturdy leash. I like leather. You know, leather's hand friendly. Chain mm -hmm. chain leashes, not hand friendly. Yeah, I don't like right. them either. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they if, if they have any questions, if they you know, maybe want to set up a, a, an evaluation for their dog? Um, the best way is my my contact, my cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, I I have you know my Facebook page, and I get messages through Facebook, but I don't. I typically don't respond. Um, I'll just have them call. I'll mm -hmm. just send them my number. It's easier to kind of answer questions via phone versus, you know, sending this big, long paragraph, yeah. which, you know, <laughs> can sometimes be misconstrued. Mm -hmm. You know, I might not get my point across clearly. You know, I might an not answer their question in the way that they were asking. Mm -hmm. um, so I prefer phone calls. So that way I can get back to you in a timely manner. All right, cool. All right, well, well thank you, Manny, for stopping thank by you. again. Thank you.